This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the early 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming back the gorgeous, the talented, the passionate, I am talking about Andrea Lido. And Andrea has a documentary that she made that's going to be coming out soon called My Father Moves Mountains, How George Lido Bulldozed the Hollywood Blacklist. And I have seen this documentary. She sent me a screener of it, and I was moved from start to finish. It brought tears to my eyes, especially in the last 20 minutes. I mean, it was compelling, beyond compelling. And um, it just won... Um, an award over at the uh, Barcelona Film Festival, and I am so excited. I'm so excited for her. I'm so excited for this documentary. It's rendering me speechless. Like, it is such a beautiful portrait of her father, the great movie producer George Lido, who produced Over the Edge, Dress to Kill, you know, Obsession, Drive-In, which I want to bring up a little bit today because I just saw that movie recently, and it makes me think, what the fuck? <laughs> You know, it is a very slow teen movie from 1976. Gary Cavagnero was on here a few years ago, and we talked about it, but I hadn't seen it yet, so I'm going to see if I can bring it up today with Andrea. And uh, today is the 82nd anniversary of Pearl Harbor, and tomorrow will be 43 years since John Lennon was assassinated, the day the music died. Rest in peace, John Lennon. We miss you every day. So yeah, here is my new interview with Andrea Lido. Hello. Hey, Andrea. Welcome back. How are you today? Fine, thank you. How are you? Well, despite all the fucking craziness in the world, I can't complain. <laughs> No, there is n neither, I'll tell you. So, I thoroughly enjoyed My Father Moves Mountains, how George Leto bulldozed the uh, Hollywood blacklist. And I gotta tell you, I go into every documentary with the same low expectation of, oh, uh, this is gonna be another self-congratulatory prophecy. But then once in a while, something good comes along that blows me away and moves me. And this was certainly one of those. Now, I remember... Thank you. Yes, I remember in 2020 when uh, you and I first talked, you were still working on it. So what was the genesis behind it in the first place? Um, a couple of things. One was, uh, for years I'd had this idea that I had this really unusual upbringing. I had grown up with all of these blacklisted writers, with one is my godfather. Uh -huh. And then I, I was fully aware of the fact that my father was kind of trailblazing. It was something I understood because I knew how different he was than I was. Um, because I, I grew up with this really very Martin Luther King-like belief that the content of people's character are how we should judge them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't believe in saying we're colorblind. And of course we see colors. We're all different colors. We're all different creeds. We're all different political beliefs. The right. content of people's character dictated okay. to my father and, and therefore my family and me mm -hmm. how we would judge people and how we would decide whether or not we wanted to have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I saw how unique that made my, my family. Mm -hmm. and, and my <coughs> on life. Um, and I also thought that what my father had done was nothing short of extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, and people didn't necessarily know about it. I mean, he'd done such a good job of making the blacklist go away that people had forgotten about it. Yeah. So when he was in his late 80s, um, I had proposed a couple of ideas. I, I proposed a couple of articles to various magazines and journalists about this whole thing. And, you know, people were sort of a, a book deal, and nobody really got it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? Somebody had interviewed him for some DVD extras or something. 
yeah. and I looked at them and all the outtakes, and I said, you know, this stuff is so good. So what I went and did is I bought all the outtakes. I bought the footage. Oh. And we didn't have an exclusive deal with the company. There was no work for hire or contract. It was all done very loosey goosey. Mm. So I bought the footage. I licensed the footage to use in a documentary. And I wasn't exactly sure how it was going to come out, but I was going to start by interviewing him. So I took that interview and then I expanded upon it. You can see he's, he's in a yellow chair in one interview and then in another interview he has sort of a gray curtain behind him and he's wearing a lighter colored sweater. I interviewed him the week before he died. Yeah. I, I did not know he was dying. I saw he was slowing down but I was not aware he was dying. He didn't tell me. So when he passed away, I, I feel like it's almost as if his spirit sort of jumped into me. Mm -hmm. And I just felt this burning need to tell his story. And I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't have any financing other than my own money. But somehow, some way, I, I'm so much like him, I decided that the courage of my conviction, that this is what I was going to do. And I just kept doing it a step at a time. And more and more doors opened for me, and I was able to make enough money to finance it myself. Mm -hmm. And um, the first big interview I got outside of family was Glenn Frankel, who mm -hmm. wrote a book um, about Midnight Cowboy. And, uh, and he's a journalist from the Washington Post, and he had written another book about Carl Franklin and High Noon. Mm -hmm. He was a, a sort of little expert on the blacklist. And he gave a fantastic interview. I went to Washington, D.C. And, and interviewed him. And then because I got Glenn Frankel, I was able to get Alan Rohde and I got Nancy Allen. And, and all of a sudden, I was able to cobble together interviews. And I own um, the remake rights of the footage to Over the Edge and Obsession, so I knew I could use that. I got a top fair use attorney, and I brazenly figured out how I could put archival footage in there to fill the gaps in the holes. I used a lot of personal pictures that I didn't have to pay for. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it just sort of little by little came together. It took me four years because the pandemic shut me down for almost two. Right. So I had dogged determination. I, I decided that this was just something I had to do. The other thing that really it kind of pissed me off, and sometimes anger, you can take your anger and fuel, it fuels you into doing something good. Mm -hmm. At the Academy Awards Memorial in 2020, you know, the in memoriam where they show people, my father had died in April of 2019, so he should have been in the 2020 telecast. Mm -hmm. They did not put his picture up there. Awful. They put him on the online one they did with hundreds of names. But, you know, there were crew members who I'm sure did a wonderful job but didn't make the kind of contribution to this business that my father made. And they left him off, and I was furious. Awful. I was furious not just for him, but for all the people whose lives he changed. Mm -hmm. It was almost as if they were saying that nothing happened. Yeah. It didn't take someone, you know, they talk about the blacklist ending as if Kirk Douglas ended it because he got Dalton Trumbo's Spartacus under his own name, Kirk Douglas and Otto Preminger. Mm -hmm. But it didn't end there. That was just the crack in the facade. Mm -hmm. And I was sick and tired of hearing or reading articles and stories. It gave all the credit to Kirk Douglas, who, by the way, Kirk and Otto deserve a ton of credit for what they did. Mm -hmm. But they weren't the only ones. In fact, my father did much more to systematically end the blacklist than Kirk and Otto. They were brave for being first, and I give them 100% of the credit for that. But they didn't end it. They just put the crack in it that broke the wall down. Mm -hmm. So that my father could come in, essentially, with a sledgehammer and get rid of the rest of it. And it started with Waldo Salt and Midnight Cowboy, and it continued. And I just was not content to let history forget him. 
it was just not okay by me. Mm -hmm. And that's what made me decide to do it. And I put my own money up, which I know you're not supposed to do in the movie business. Mm -hmm. But um, <clears throat> I firmly believe that someone will buy this and I will get my money out because this is a story that should be told. And the more we saw with, I'm going to inject some politics in here, because you can't talk about the blacklist without talking about politics. Mm -hmm. People burning books and banning books and saying, don't say gay, and abridging people's constitutional rights. The more I saw relationships in the 1950s and the Red Scare and the House of Un-American Activities Committee, where people were afraid to speak truth to power because it might get them labeled communist and it might makes them not be able to go to work the next day. Mm -hmm. And I said, we need more people like George Lito. We need more people like Kirk Douglas and Otto Preminger. We need more people who are not afraid to do what's right. To stand up for what's right. Because otherwise, you know, they say, uh -huh. evil only persists because good people do nothing. Mm-hmm. I want to inspire future filmmakers, future executives, future producers, future financiers to do something and to stand up for speaking truth to power, to stand up for people's rights, First Amendment rights. The marketplace can dictate whether or not they want to hire you based on your talent or even if they don't like what you have to say. Right. But you cannot blacklist. I'm not... I'm absolutely against cancel culture. I yeah. mean, I think, frankly, Harvey Weinstein should be canceled because he committed atrocious crime. That is different than not liking someone's opinion. And people have many opinions I don't like. Mm -hmm. I'm an unabashed, you know, centrist Democrat with, you know, some socially liberal leanings. But I do not like the extreme left, and I do not like the extreme right. I think that extremes on both ends cause people to to stop listening and it's just a lot of screaming and noise and I mean, you can say well wait a minute you, you believe in, in standing up for communists no I believe in standing up to their first amendment right to be communist mm -hmm. I, I believe in your first amendment right to, to be uh, a person who believes in an oligarchy not that I think an oligarchy is good for this country but you're entitled to believe it where I think the First Amendment ends is, according to the Supreme Court, where hate speech is incited. It incite, an inc incite, an incitement to violence. You cannot yell fire in a crowded theater. <laughs> you know, you cannot say racist things to incite violence. You cannot say sexist things to incite violence against women. You cannot say things in a public forum would otherwise disenfranchise people from their rights. That's when you're now absolutely crossing the line. Yeah. And so they were not crossing the line. They were standing up for people's right to a 40 hour work week, to women's equal rights, to an end to Jim Crow laws, to seeing more African Americans in film. And these were the guys who were labeled subversive because they had been to some communist meetings and they had been to some Marxist meetings in the 30s when it was in vogue, frankly, mm -hmm. to, to counteract the fact that this country had been run by vulture capitalists and mm -hmm. run it into the ground with the Depression. So the fact that they were exploring alternative ways to cure the ills of this country, I mean, that's what it's done. It's done by discussion. And, and people can come to conclusions that they find later that they're not right about. But nobody was trying to hurt anybody. The thing is, there were people in this country who were running around lynching people wearing white sheets called the KKK. Yeah. Nobody was ragging their asses for Congress for being subversive. I, I love yeah. how you addressed the, the blacklisting and the anti-Semitism, because 
Last summer, I had a couple of days off from podcasting. I was reading up on our con- on our country's history, and I found out this man. Whenever I bring up his name, it's it totally stumps people, and that's by design because the government doesn't want kids to learn about this man. Otherwise, it's the end of consumerism. His name is uh, Edward Bernays. He was Sigmund Freud's nephew, and he invented uh, public relations. He's the reason women start smoking cigarettes. People started eating bacon and eggs for breakfast. All the Republican okay. politicians getting elected and so forth and he wrote um, a couple of books about how you know he used his, his he used um, his uncle Sigmund Freud's um, um, psychiatry tactics to manipulate the masses to get them to consume and you know there's one where he talks about how the Nazis uh, stole his ideas and started the pro- uh, Nazi propaganda uh, for it. And people talk about books being banned. Those three books he wrote should be banned because they're essentially manuals on how to be a fascist dictator Nazi. Well, no, I don't think they should be banned because you could also learn from those manuals how people were manipulated and, and try to avoid it. The problem is that that, you know, Nazism in this country has had its home, you know, long before the white nationalist movement of today. Mm-hmm. I mean, Father Coughlin, and, you know, there was an entire Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden in the late 30s, when, and they were preventing Jews from coming to this country as refugees for the longest time. I mean, you know, we could have saved more Jews from concentration camps by allowing them to come into this country in the late 30s. But we didn't. Mm. We did not get into World War II until the Japanese bombed us. So, and we probably would not have if they had. So the thing is that, um, and I can't really speak to that for sure because God knows what other event might have dragged us in, uh-huh. we certainly had no interest in another you know, giant conflict in Europe, and the United States was turning a blind eye to the genocide of the Holocaust. Um, because this country, at the time, had a very small Jewish population, Jewish population, mm-hmm. and anti-Semitism was much more acceptable amongst polite society. And you have to understand that the blacklist was deeply anti-Semitic. But the irony of the whole thing is that the Congress scared the studio heads so badly into being their own Uncle Tom's, essentially. Mm-hmm. They, they turned on their own. Yeah. Um, and they didn't just do it as long as QAC was in session. They continued to do it for years after HUAC had disbanded. And they continued the practice of this blacklist for more than a decade afterwards. And that's why Kirk Douglas and Otto Preminger mm-hmm. and my father, George Leto, said enough is enough. As my father said, these people were pure writers. It's what they knew, it's what they did. They were writers, they were directors, they were actors. They they were brilliant at what they did. My father didn't just represent them because they were blacklisted. They were some of the best writers in Hollywood before they had been blacklisted. Mm -hmm. And my father thought that what had happened to them during HUAC was horrifically unfair. But it was even more unfair that this practice had continued long after HUAC had been disbanded. And J. Parnell Thomas, the, the House of Un-American Activities Committee chair, had been found guilty of fraud and embezzlement. I mean, I'm sorry. The whole thing was a giant kabuki theater sham. And propaganda is just another name for political marketing. Yeah. So, uh, I... Is this because I don't think it's just about George Leto. Mm-hmm. No, it is very much about George Leto and the fact that he moved mountains. He literally moved mountains to, to change the trajectory of these people's lives. And to change Hollywood. Because mm-hmm. Midnight Cowboy, Coming Home, MASH, Happy On, Planet of the Apes, Tell Him Willie Boy is Here. 
Mm-hmm. None of those films would have been made. The accident, the caretaker, these are all films that were made under my father's, you know, as, as he was <clears throat> their agent. Um, you know, the other films were uh, Arnold Pearl or Cotton Comes to, Har- Comes to Harlem. Those films would not have been made if it were for George Leto, because those clients wouldn't have had a chance to write those films or direct those films, or in Abe's case, write and direct Abe Polanski, those films, because the studios wouldn't have allowed them. Mm. Certainly not under their own names. I mean, there wouldn't be the Waldo Salt Screenwriting Award at Sundance, because there would have been no more Waldo Salt. Yeah. He, he was writing under the name Mel Davenport. So, I mean, the fact is that it just upset me that he had my father's contribution and that the blacklist had been forgotten. Mm-hmm. It was such a blight on this industry and on this country. And I don't think we should forget history mm-hmm. because we are doomed to repeat it. But I've yep. said it before and I will say it again out loud and I'm going to keep saying it until the Academy listens to me. And frankly, they own my father yep. for forgetting him that he ought to win the Gene Herschel Humanitarian Award because I cannot think of anything more humanitarian than standing up and risking your own career and your own freedom, frankly, because the FBI used to come to the house and interrogate my father. Mm -hmm. To give people their lives, their work, their names, and their dignity back. What is more humanitarian than that? I agree. I agree. And and my life is so inexorably linked, not just because he's my father and I'm, I work in the industry and I'm a filmmaker, but because they had <laughs> the audacity, and I say that in quotes, to make a Polanski my godfather, which, you know, as Roman Catholic Italians, Mm-hmm. Not supposed to have a Jewish godfather, but they <laughs> lied to the priest and said he was Polish Catholic, which I think is fantastic, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to tell you, that part in the documentary had me on the floor laughing when you, you were like, uh, like, you know, my my godparents, they lied to the priest. It fits in with my sensibility. That had me on the floor. <laughs> oh, yeah, because my sensibility is just a most, that, that his character mattered more than his faith. Yes. You know, the faith is irrelevant to me. And by the way, I, oh. I think there is merit in the basis of all faith. I mean, the basis of Judeo-Christian religion and the basis of Islamism and the basis of Buddhism, I mean, all of them basically say, be a good person, be good to your fellow man. Mm. And they all have a different idea of what the reward will be, either in this life or the next. But... It's mm-hmm. not about the reward. It's about being a decent human being. Yes. And so I'm a humanist. That is my religion. Same here. I believe in being decent to my fellow man, and I, and I wake up every morning and try my best. Now, if you cross me and you try to hurt me in some way, gloves are off. Same here. I am my dad's daughter. I am afraid of no one. Uh, I'm not easily intimidated. And I'm about five foot one and 120 pounds. <laughs> yep. Um, but that said, I, because I, you know, I have my dad's courage, and I'm, and I'm so grateful that I had a father who taught me to be that kind of person. I'm so grateful that I was brought up by a father who told me that I was not limited because I was a woman. Mm-hmm. And if I wanted to do something. Other people may try to limit me. That is a reality of life. But I didn't have to believe that I should be limited because I was not born with an additional appendage. So I, not too many Sicilian fathers born in 1930 had that point of view. And I was super grateful because when I sit around a table with my girlfriends from high school, for example, we just had a little reunion, and I went to high school here in Los Angeles, Marymount High School. It was an all-girls school, which I chose to go to. 
Mm-hmm. I chose to go both to an all-girls school and a Catholic all-girls school. We shocked my father enormously because he knew I was not terribly religious by the time I was a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was very apparent to him because I had already declined to be confirmed in the Catholic faith, so I, I, I declined to do it because I said to my parents, that, I don't know, maybe the Jews are right. Maybe Jesus was just a prophet. Yeah. And my, my dad had to laughed. My mom was a little more concerned about what people would think, but I think she, she appreciated that I had a mind of my own that I could change my mind any day of the week. So when I came home and I said I wanted to go to Marymount High School as opposed to some of the other private high schools in the city that I had visited, and my father said, I'm just curious why you chose the Catholic school. And I said, well, Dad, the girls are nicer. And he said, but you're going to have to take religion class. And he almost fell out of his chair when I told him my answer. I said, yeah, Dad, I understand that, but religion is one hour a day, and bitch is all day. Yeah. I'm going for religion. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and it, and it, I'm very, you can see how I'm like him. I was very pragmatic in my decision making because I was going to judge the school and the people in it based on the content of their character, not their religious persuasion, not, you know, I, I judged the school for its academic ability because I was a point extra. Um, I was a total, that's why I wanted to go to a girls' school because. I, I did not want to be subjected to male testosterone at that age. I just wanted to go to school and study. And um, I was, I had my own mind at a very young age. because It was instilled in me that I should. Um, yeah. And I was, I'm, I'm just really grateful. So when I sit around and listen to my girlfriends talk now, and they talk about, you know, teachers that they thought were inappropriate or, this, that, or the other thing, and yeah. I realized how incredibly immune I was to so much of this, because I I had a mouth on me. I, I would defend myself. I knew how to talk to people and mm-hmm. stand up for my myself and my rights, probably because I grew up, you know, with a Polanski in my ear talking about Marxism and communism and existentialism and reading me Shakespeare and Waldo Salt. And if you just sat around and listened to these guys talk, you you absorbed by osmosis mm-hmm. these intellectual discourses about, you know, rights and politics and everything that was going on. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, for example, Abe did not believe that capitalism and, and Marxism were at odds with each other. And, and I would ask him about that, and he'd say, well, you can still allow people to make money and to own property and to own intellectual property and rights and still have a society that takes care of all of its people. It just depends on how you want to organize your society. And certainly European countries like Sweden, Norway, Finland, all of the European countries have some blended version of that. Um, some are more capitalists, some are more socialist, you know, and I think that each society works for its people in its, in its best way. You know, the Swedes and the Norwegians have very different attitudes, for example, than the Italians. Right. You know, who have very different attitudes than the French and have very different attitudes from the Germans and the Brits, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so each society has to decide what version of that blend works for them. In America, we have decided to eschew capitalism as a dirty, I mean, uh, communism as a dirty word completely. Mm-hmm. But when you ask people if you want to take away their Social Security or Medicare, they slip out and say no, and, and they, they don't realize it's one of the two socialist programs we have in this country. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's not all so bad, is the point. And, and I'm not, really not, you know, sitting here touting communism. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not that far left. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I do believe that America, as rich as a country as it is, would decide to make adjustments, you know, in its mentality and how it takes care of its, all of its people, its elderly, its indigent people, its the people who need the help the most. Because you can complain about the homeless on the street. But if we had, if you had to pay a small increase in your taxes, Mm -hmm. 
and you would never see another homeless person again. Or maybe we took a little, we bought one less war plane, and, and we never had to see another homeless person again. Wouldn't society be healthier? I mean, when you put it to people in those terms, and you don't say left or right, they start listening to each other. I was watching MSNBC last night because I saw something I thought was incredible. Liz Cheney and Nancy Pelosi were on together, mm -hmm. and they were speaking of each other fondly, and how working together on the January 6th commission was something that they were grateful they had the opportunity to get to know each other in a different way and to find common ground on something and work together towards the same aim. Mm -hmm. And how they learn something from each other. And I think that's what the First Amendment was designed to do. Mm -hmm. that people can come from different backgrounds, from different political spectrums, from different uh, you know, religious backgrounds, even sexual persuasion, it doesn't matter. The sexual orientation, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it doesn't matter because when people can find common ground to work together, mm -hmm. if they agree to work together as opposed to treat everyone as their enemy, the differences of opinion may bring you to maybe a better compromise somewhere in the middle or allow people to see things from a different perspective rather than just shouting at each other, yeah. then, then you can have a discourse that can be healthy and constructive. And that was what our Congress and our Senate, which were deliberative bodies, were designed to do. And it breaks down when any one group on any extreme, whether it's the far right or the far left, hijacks that and makes it about their point of view and their point of view only. There's no room for discussion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I made this documentary also because I didn't like what I was seeing anymore. I didn't like the kind of people who were running for office and running this country. Mm -hmm. I didn't like, on both sides, there are fewer and fewer people who get into politics to actually serve. There are still some left, but there's plenty of people who are just looking for a book deal. Yeah. And the people that my father represented standing up for our First Amendment rights did not throw away their lives for this. They didn't give up 10 or 15 years of their comfort for this. The people who you know, fought for this country during World War II, did not give and died or remained, did not give up their lives for this. And my father didn't risk everything he risked for this, for corporations to roll steamroller over people and give them no voice, for the court to be corrupted, for the Congress to have people like, I'm going to say it, Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, Mm -hmm. You know, screaming in the middle of a presidential address. Yeah. The loss of decorum and and discussion about from different points of view that leads to a reasonable compromise. The loss of that is to me the, the biggest problem we face now. But it is it stems from the same polarization and demonization of people. And HUAC, they started by demonizing communists and socialists. And we've had a problem ever since. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have to you know, I mean the, the John Wayne interview was perfect. That's why I put it in there. Where yeah. he said, Well, if we hadn't done the blacklist, then the the, the liberal the radical liberals were gonna take over our business. Yeah. I mean, it, doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah. I mean... <laughs> I couldn't believe that he, he's using rhetoric that we're still using 40 years later. Oh, yeah. 
I mean, there's a there was an interview in 1983 or four where this 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 Russian, uh, he he like worked for the Soviet Union. He like gave this interview talking about how to demoralize a country, and it pretty much stands with what's going on today and everything. You know, he says it takes you know 20 years to do that. You know, it's been 40 years since that interview. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I've been guilty, too, of going on rants on social media in the past, and as I get older, I, I you know, I've learned to be more uh, constrained about the things that I say, mm-hmm. but, you know, because social media, when it was first invented, I think it just became sort of a free-for-all. Yeah. People didn't realize the negative impact it had. Right. Because it, it, it hit us so quickly, and I'm not blaming anyone. I'm yeah. not saying that any one particular group or company is bad. I mean, because we're all responsible for our own actions on social media. Let's, let's start there. It also, you too, know, whatever would... Whatever the social media company policies are about free speech, we are all responsible for our own behavior. Right. And I think we didn't know how to behave because it, it's sort of is the people who had felt that their voices were not being heard, particularly by their representatives, locally and in state and federally, who felt like this was a forum that they could vent. And all it tells me when I see all kinds of stuff on social media is that people still don't feel that their voices are being heard by the people who are supposed to represent them. But also, the people who are supposed to represent them are not leading. Mm-hmm. I feel the same way about, you know, Hollywood and the people in charge in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. You know, you have all these voices of discontent <coughs> about diversity and LGBTQ, and, but the people in charge, the studio heads, who are run by corporate heads now. Yeah, like Disney. Right. I mean, Bob Iger and, and David Zasloff saying that from his yacht that the, that the writers and actors need to get realistic. And David Zasloff, who was not directly quoted as saying, but the rumor is that he said, he's the one who said it, they should go bankrupt and I hope they get evicted. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, but that is entirely tone deaf. They are the leaders of this industry. The titans of this industry. And for them to show such disrespect for writers and actors because part of the blacklist, the reason for the blacklist is because the writers were forming the Screenwriters Union. And they wanted to decide how they got credit and not be, allow the studios to decide who got credit. Because the studios were uneven in, in deciding, you know, they played favorites. Who got credit for what? So they wanted to have a, a that decided on uh, a fair basis who got credit, who wrote scripts, who, you know, how much they were entitled to be paid, minimum payments, and things like that, to protect writers. Mm-hmm. And here we are sitting in 2023, and Bob Iger and David Zasloff, while sitting on his, you know, $200 million or $400 million yacht, and David Zasloff, who, who made, you know, God knows how many hundreds of millions of dollars by putting Discovery with Warner Brothers, merging the two, we're, we're, we're advocating for the homelessness of the artists that create the wealth that they're sitting on. And I don't care if Disney and Warner Brothers don't want to work with me. Because obviously I'm not afraid of a black woman. Mm-hmm. So I will say it. You know, there's plenty of other buyers out there. And, and Saturn knows too at Netflix. You know, they didn't want to pay residuals. I, I know this because I'm a, I'm a member of SAC. Mm-hmm. And, and I have plenty of friends who are in the writer's guild in SAC. Oh, yes, Frankie, that's my cat, Frankie. <laughs> 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 and and I'm, I think it's terrible to think of that. I, I think it's, it's shameful. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, yeah. I don't think they realized how much it was going to backfire in their face, which I'm very glad it did. I'm very glad the public stood behind them, uh, stood behind the, the workers, the writers, the actors, mm-hmm. the 
people who make this content. I mean, I mean, I guess they think they could just make everything with AI now, and they don't need us. But that isn't entirely true. Because AI doesn't work without feeding. I know. Oh, don't get me started on AI. It's it's driving me crazy. I've been hearing about it nonstop. <laughs> you know, it's it's really really scary. But I want to say congratulations on Barcelona and let's call out Sundance. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Well, Barcelona. I I am very grateful to the Barcelona, the ARFF, the Around International Film Festival. It's an online festival award. Um, and they have uh, four cities participate, Barcelona, Paris, Amsterdam, and Berlin. And they choose a winner every month um, to single out of all the films that get submitted. And then at the end of the year, I believe sometime in March, uh, Barcelona judges, they give their annual winner from the, the monthly winners um, an award as well mm -hmm. uh, at, at their festival. Um, but... Uh, it, it is a prestigious. It is a prestigious group, and you know they have thousands of entries. So I am very grateful, and they're from around the world. I am very grateful that that they saw the merit in this film, and you know I try to make this film fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just went on a very political tangent, very serious. But my father was a very gregarious person. Yeah, which is. Um, very obvious in the fact that I did an entire laugh montage because he had such a, you know, infectious laugh. Yeah. <laughs> um, and everybody commented on his wonderful laugh in their interviews, so I felt like I, I needed to do that. But also, uh, you know, I, I put some animation in there and I put some things in there to lighten the moment because even though this is all very serious stuff. Yeah, I wanted to compliment you on that because every documentary I see now, they, they fucking want to be Robert Evans, The Kid Stays in the Picture, and they can't fucking do that. There's only one of those. You know, I, just the animation in documentaries drives me crazy, but I'm glad you didn't overdo it. Oh, no, I, I did not want to overdo it. I really... This all actually started because in the opening prologue, when I tell the story of how my father actually moved a mountain, um, I just... I did it with pictures and all of this stuff at first, and then I thought, it's missing George. And there's just, there was no other way to put George in that prologue, except to animate him in, in the bulldozer, um, which is where the title came from, How George Little Bulldozed the Hollywood Blacklist, because he did. And, and if you knew my father, you knew when he was, just, he decided he was going to do something, he was like a bulldozer. He just, didn't matter what was in his way. He mm -hmm. was just going to get it done. He didn't want to hurt anybody. He wasn't trying to create any, you know, any um, undue uh, problems for people who, frankly, who didn't deserve them because some people deserve the problems they got. But he was absolutely determined to succeed. And, and that was very true in how he literally moved a physical mountain. Mm -hmm. In, a, in, in, the, in the opening prologue story. So it started with that. And then when I couldn't find a mugshot for J. Parnell Thomas, mm -hmm. um, who, <laughs> <laughs> who was such a scumbag, and, yeah. and that speech I got from the, uh, the Congress, from the HUAC, of him talking about, you know, rooting out the evil and this, this really, you know, hypocritical speech while he himself is committing fraud and, and, you know, and extra uh, embezzlement. I mean, it was just hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> when I was trying to find a mugshot and I couldn't find one, there was no archival footage of mugshots or anything of him in federal prison. I kind of called up my animator and I said, hey, can you take this guy's face and put it on the cartoon prison garb and put him <laughs> in behind the jail cell? with the chickens, you'll have to see the movie to understand how the chickens fit in. And um, and then my animator, you know, just took it a step further and had the chicken with shit on his head. Yeah. Which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then I, you know, and then there's George and the Dragon. I, I did that because of uh, the, the St. George the Dragon Slayer. And we used to say about my dad that, you know, he... He was not afraid to slay dragons. I mean, he would stand up to studio heads, the FBI, whoever got in his way. Yeah. And he knew that there might be a price. 
you know, I, I saw my father have numerous lawsuits over the course of his career. It's almost impossible to be in business in, in this industry and not have a couple of lawsuits. Mm-hmm. And he stood up to studios that were worth $80 billion. He stood up to insurance companies, the two largest insurance companies in the world, Axe and AIG. And he either won or settled all of those lawsuits. So he Amazing. had to have had the, you know, quite the heart of a lion. And he certainly was like St. George the Dragon Slayer. I mean, all of those big dragons were, you know, his, he wasn't afraid to stand up. Yeah. I'm going to swap out my AirPods here. They're dying. One second. Mm-hmm. Make sure you can hear me. I can hear you. There you go. So, um, I also did that because of, well, one of his associates saying that Waldo Sellett said George was like, you know, a guy with a shield and a, and a sword going after the bad guys. <laughs> and I felt like it needed a little humor because it was quite a funny statement, too. Um... And so we incorporated all this, and then we incorporated it into the end of the movie to sort of tie it all up so that it didn't just drop there like loose ends. But yes, I was not interested in doing the Robert Evans, the kid stays in the picture. Um, Good. <laughs> I think. Well, no, but also somebody had done it. I'm, I'm not interested in imitation. Right. My father was unique, and I was going to make something that was unique like him. And I'm very grateful to all the people who participated. John Patak, who was a partner at CAA and um, for many years, and is my father's friend, has been enormously supportive of this documentary, has been, has been uh, Alan Rohde, who is a historian, was notably on TCM. I've had Alan on. Classic movies. Yeah. Who uh, is an MC or is a guest to discuss certain movies or history. Yeah. And Glenn Frankel. I mean, these people did not have to sit down with me. Nancy Allen was incredibly gracious. In fact, the hardest thing I, I said this to Red Gilbert, the hardest task I had was cutting her interview down. Uh-huh. Because she had so many wonderful things to say. And, and she knew my father personally and, and understood his drive and how that drive translated into giving Brian a call with a career that he had. Because he put up his own house and his own money to make Obsession. And Obsession is what put Brian on the map as a world-class director. Mm-hmm. And it made it possible for him to carry King out afterwards. And then made it possible for him to do Dress to Kill, which... I don't think people really thought about it at the time is the first movie to feature a trans lead. Mm-hmm. And, and how that movie has affected the trans community in, in the best of ways. They love this film. I was not really aware of until I did this documentary. Mm-hmm. So I actually even discovered some things about my father and the impact he had on various people and groups in society um, as I was doing this. And so it, it was a labor of love, for sure. But it was also designed to make sure that we... I would really like as many filmmakers as possible around the world to see this so that they can decide who they want to be. Mm-hmm. What kind of filmmaker do they want to be? I don't think everybody has to make films with social content. Right. But when people come to me and they say, I want to do this, I want to do that, and then that's the first thing I ask people when they're asking me for, their, for advice about becoming a filmmaker or working in the industry, I say, well, who do you want to be? Mm-hmm. And they usually say, well, I want to be successful. I want to be, no, 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 no. That's what you want to be. Tell me who do you want to be? What right. Kind of person you want to be? What, what drives you to get up in the morning? What matters to you? How do you want to treat other people? Because all the rest is just, it's just stuff. Like, do this and do that. But you're going to come into all kinds of 
opportunities, conflicts, things are going to come up. I mean, you have to decide who you want to be in that situation. What kind of person do you want to be in that situation? And that will dictate what kind of career you're going to have. Mm -hmm. Because people, they remember. I don't think anyone's going to forget what Zazov and Iger said, no matter what. People may still go to work at Disney, they may still go to work at Warner Brothers, but they don't forget. People remember who you are, and, and the minute your star stops rising, the business has a tendency to pounce on you the minute you're vulnerable. And the more reviled and hated you are when you are on top, the more they can't wait to kick you when you're down. Mm-hmm. But the more respected and appreciated you are, no matter what stage of the business you're in, the more people are going to want to work with you and help you. And so there, are, talent is another thing. Because talent gives you another different kind of opportunity. Because talent is also very respected. Yeah, like during this documentary, I discovered that you had a talent for singing, and I didn't know that. Your voice is beautiful. I mean, beautiful. Velvet. Thank you. Yeah. I like, to keep that intimate at the piano and not, you know, sing out movies. I am actually Broadway trained. Um, yeah, I could tell, Broadway, you know. I, I Broadway could, trained singer. <laughs> I'd, I'd, love to hear, I'd love to hear you do Cole yes. Porter's You're the Top. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I love Cole Porter. Um, yeah. I, I love the American song, but here's the other thing I'm very grateful for. I grew up in a house that was musical. Mm -hmm. My father played the piano and jazz saxophone. Um, my, my mother played piano that was almost concert level. I mean, she was so good. She wouldn't say so. <clears throat> she said, well, I never played for, you know, the Philharmonic, but she was, she was really that good. And, um, yeah, I grew up singing and I played the piano. I'm not the greatest pianist, but, um. A very small hand, so I, I got frustrated very young that I could barely reach an octave. Um, but I, I learned to sing. I was lucky. I opened my mouth one day, and people, oh, she can sing, and I carry a tune. And I have pretty big lungs. I can sing sing pretty forcefully, like a Broadway belter. Yeah. And then I have a nice wide range. So I studied singing throughout high school and then college, and then after college, I. I went to NYU's CAP 21 program, and I did that. Um, and I studied privately with uh, Marge Rivingston, for example, who trained Linda Ronstadt and Bette Midler. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, small people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was great. She was fantastic. And um, she told me, actually, something about Bette that Bette Midler had one of the most natural voices she had ever heard. Mm -hmm. That could do amazing things without warming up. Like she just, her mouth, she would open her mouth and even well into her later years, she had an incredible facility. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought that was really interesting because some people, you know, really do have to work at it. Some people have a very natural gift and it's all what you decide to do with it. But getting back to the singing, I, I'm in the process of doing, organizing an album, a soundtrack album to accompany the documentary. I'm in discussions with a big music company, one of the big three, mm -hmm. to release the soundtrack album in which we will put the complete songs of Georgia's songs that you hear in the documentary. Oh. Um, including, hopefully, the Louis Armstrong song in its entirety, which is called mm -hmm. And maybe some other uh, Georgia's original tune sung by a couple of other singers um, with, you know, some, maybe some name value. Mm -hmm. Um to complete the album because he did write some really beautiful songs. My, wrote, my father wrote songs in the 50s mm -hmm. before he became an agent in the early 50s and early 40s. I remember you telling and, me that, yeah, that he did jazz music. Mm -hmm. He was a jazz saxophone player. He used to sit in with Louis Armstrong's band 
mm -hmm. Philadelphia, which is how he ended up writing a song with Marty Napoleon, who is Louis Armstrong's pianist. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the DECA and the all the DECA collection, the All Stars Band. The All Star Band's pianist was uh, Marty Napoleon. And he and Marty and a third guy named Jackie Ackerman wrote this song one day because George had heard Louis sing La Vie en Rose. And he thought it was funny mm -hmm. if they wrote a song called <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> When I Look at You, I Feel So <clears throat> You know, playing on, riffing on Louis Armstrong's. Um, you know, his own riff. And they wrote it in 1954 and copyrighted it. Mm -hmm. And it took till 1993 for Universal Music Group to put it, Decca, on an album. Um, but you can find it on Apple iTunes and um, Apple Music. They have it on various uh, compilation albums. But I'd like to take the song and put it on the soundtrack album as well so people don't have to buy 63 songs or 83 songs from these compilation albums. Yeah. Get it. Um, exactly. But it just shows that my father was a very out-of-the-box thinker. Yeah. No matter what he did. And, and when he realized he couldn't, he didn't want to be a jazz musician because uh, jazz started to go out of vogue and uh, rock and roll was coming into to fashion in the 50s, and he joked that the jazz clubs he used to play at were becoming strip clubs. And he didn't think he was good enough to be a session musician. He decided he wanted to become a music agent. So through a, a friend, he managed to get a job at William Morris. Mm -hmm. And he thought he was going to end up in the music side. It was the first job that opened up outside the mailroom, and my dad was dying to get out of the mail. Was in the theater business, booking theater. Mm -hmm. So he ended up taking that job as an assistant agent. And his first show he booked was Mae West Come On Up and Ring Twice. Mm -hmm. He got to meet Mae West, also known as Aunt May. Yeah. And and Mae West was, as he said, was probably the best businesswoman he had ever met. She knew exactly what she wanted. She didn't take any guff from anybody. She knew exactly how much everyone was going to get paid and how to stay within budget. And she told George to bring a pad and pencil and write it all down and execute it exactly as she said. And he did. And when the opening night was finished and Aunt May was, you know, her feet were in hot water and she was exhausted, she said, Georgie, come on over here. Yeah. He stuffed $1,000 in his pocket. He said, I know they don't pay you very much over there. He was making $50 a week. Just about every story I hear about Mae West uh, from a guy ends with the two of them spending the night together. Did your dad spend the night with Mae West? <laughs> no, he did not. He, well, at least he, he told me he did not. <laughs> he was, I think, when he was in his 20s, he was in her 60s. So I doubt he would have gone there, but... I, and I think he liked to keep things professional. My dad was very good about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he did not really like to mix business and, and sex. Um, mm. I, I have an expression that he used to love. It's, uh, you know, he loved quick wit. And so I would say to many men when I was younger and, and you know, the kind of girl that you know, when you're younger, men hit on you a lot more because so they think they can get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm unattractive now. I'm just saying that I'm not as young and as impressionable. Yeah. You know, when I get hit on, I'm sad. I'd say, well, you know, I don't like to mix work and sex because then the sex becomes work and the work becomes sex and then I'm not having fun at either one. So what's the point? <laughs> I think Groucho Marx had a joke like that, too. <laughs> well... <laughs> I am happy to uh, give Groucho the original credit, though. I wasn't aware of it. but Something along those lines. He had jokes that were pretty similar. Real quick, I wanted to ask you, you know, your dad executive produced the teen movie Drive-In, and I saw it recently. Uh, a couple of years ago, I interviewed uh, Gary Cavagnero, who had been in the Bad News Bears, and after he did Drive-In, he left the business, and I wasn't aware of the, the movie at the time, but I saw about 30 minutes of it, and I fell asleep because it was very, very slow. Do, do you know much about it? Did your dad ever talk about that one? Um, I know 
know he helped raise the money and he made the deal uh, at Columbia for drive-in for Rod Amato. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't believe he was on set for you know the filming. They had other producers on set, but I know that you know Columbia and Rod they made this film and, and you know made a tidy bit of money. Um, so if there were any shenanigans on set, I'm sure my father was not necessarily aware of them. Um, because he didn't usually tolerate very much on set. Yeah. Especially when it came to, um, you know, abuses of a crew. I mean, I, I personally witnessed him when I worked on uh, a movie that never quite saw the light of day called Kansas with Matt Dillon and Andrew McCarthy. I was yeah. a 15 year old turning 16. You know, when he found out that certain PAs were being paid a flat rate without overtime and being asked to work overtime, he went to their bosses and said, either pay them the overtime or send them home. You can't do both. Yeah, it was it was kind of like an American graffiti type of uh, movie. It takes place in a drive-in, and it was shot in Texas, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> I'm sure my father didn't want to show up because it was shot in Texas as well. <laughs> you know, the heat of the summer, I believe, it was shot in the summertime. In the heat, I think he was there for about a week or two, and yeah. he was like, "Get me out of here." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, it was hot as hell, and that's all I remember him telling. I was also very young when he did drive in. I was, oh, I was six or seven. Yeah. So I, I don't remember very much. I only know kind of the stories he told, but I do remember that he really, he really enjoyed making Over the Edge. Yeah. Uh, and Obsession, of course, because Obsession was partly shot in Florence, Italy. It's like, oh, break his arm and make him go to Italy, but. And in New Orleans, which he also thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I know, I talked... I think he really I talk, enjoyed working with Vilma Zygmunt on Obsession. Um, mm-hmm. so he had a great story about Vilmish. So, you know, Vilmish is very... Um, he was helped Brian a lot on Obsession. He, he was a very good DP, but he also, Brian being a young director... I like that movie, you know, yeah. He, I think Brian learned a lot about what shots to make and, and how to use the camera from Zolus, who was a genius, in, by all accounts, as well. I met him, I always found him to be very lovely to me. And, and there was a moment where they have to shoot this, there's a, a shot of a bridge. Mm-hmm. And Brian wanted the shot a certain way. Zolus wanted to do it a different way. And so George was brought in to mediate the argument. And ultimately, they were both good. So George sided with the director, because the director's vision, which is the right thing to do. And Bowlish took George aside and said, George, I can't shoot this this way. I, I just can't. And George very calmly said, Bowlish, I'm going to make this easy for you. I put up my own money to make this movie. Mm-hmm. You either shoot the bridge the way I ask you, or I throw you over it. <laughs> and Thomas laughed. That's he how Italians up. talk, I can tell you. Thomas <laughs> <laughs> laughed because he understood what my father was trying to say. <laughs> like, don't, don't, don't make me have to get upset with you. This is my money and my time is being wasted. Just, just shoot the damn bridge the way the director wants because it's not bad. You know? Mm-hmm. And... And Zilmer sort of laughed, said, okay, okay, George. And he did what Brian wanted. And, and the movie's considered a classic, and I, you know, I don't think anyone has any problem with the bridge shot. Yeah. I've heard anyone complain about it. So, it, you know, sometimes it is subjective. Yeah, I, mean, I talked to Ellen Gear earlier this year. She loved working on Over the Edge, uh, she told me. And I, I love the fact that you got Vincent Spano interviewed in the documentary. He's still a handsome guy, <laughs> I have to say. He really is. And, you know, he and I are still friends. I mean, we mm. met when we were children. Yeah. I mean, he was, I was, a, he was a teenager and I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and my father was always very kind to Matt and, and, and Vincent. Um, whenever they called or needed advice, or he he stayed in touch with them. But then there was kind of a long period where Vincent and my father didn't really see each other. Just people go different directions. No, there's no acrimony. Right. And I ran into Vincent through a friend of mine from Italy, ironically, um, 
who was here visiting from Rome, and she's like, oh, she said, do you know Vincent Spano? Because he says he knows you and your dad. And I said, of course I do. <laughs> and she brought him to dinner, and we just laughed so hard that it took a friend from Rome to get us back together in Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's the world we live in. Well, we are friends to this day. And in fact, um, I have another project that I'm working on, which is a book series mm-hmm. that was published by Simon & Schuster, and the writer is a lovely guy named John Lansing. It's we're trying to turn into a television series. Nice. And the star, you know, it's like a Tom Clancy series of books. Yeah. Um, he's named Jack Bertolino, a New York Italian. He's a cop, you know, he's an ex-cop. And it's, it's their detective books. They're, they're crime books. And they have a huge following. And, you know, I would very much like Vincent, if, if we can get the studios to do the project and to agree. I very much like Vincent to play the lead because he's the best guy for it. Mm-hmm. I mean, he is that character. And so we're, I'm working with Barbara DeFina, who is, of course, Marty Scorsese's producing partner was for 30 plus years from Goodfellas to Hugo. And we're joking that we're all paisans making this thing. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, all of our all of our discussions are usually over, you know, good bottles of wine. Yeah. <laughs> which, makes, which makes working a lot more pleasant. Um, but Vincent's a great guy, and, and it, it's very true that he kept his name because my father, my father insisted that he keep his name, that he be proud of his heritage and not hide from it. Mm-hmm. Because I don't think people realize that being Italian in this country was a bit of a stigma up until about the mid-80s, early 90s. Mm-hmm. I mean, Armani and Goodfellas and Armani, really, just made being Italian cool. Yeah. But we were on the wrong side of the war in World War II. People forget that. Italians were on the wrong side of the war, we are meaning the Italians. Mm-hmm. And we were not a very well-liked immigrant group. I mean, we were treated in this country 100 years ago much like we treat Mexicans today, mm-hmm. or Central Americans. And so being Italian was not something to easily be proud of. And my father told Vincent to be proud of who he was, not to run away from it. And I think Vincent's very gratified that he kept his proper name his entire life as a result. And I don't believe it hurt his career. Mm-hmm. So... You know, I, I think that's quintessential George. Be who you are. Be the best you you can be. And believe in yourself. And stand up for what you believe in. And my father had this wonderful expression. Believe in your own ability to make your own proposition good. And I think that's exactly how I made this doc. Is I took it a step at a time. And I just kept believing in my own ability to find a way to get it done. And I am very grateful to my animator, his name is Darius Shivek, mm-hmm. and to my colorist, Jeff Jacobson, and my archivist, David Steckler, and the Post House P3, and my post producer, Bill Phil. And I even had a second unit director, a guy named Mark Pavia, who's actually Stephen King discovered him. You're like, are you a Stephen King guy on your phone? Oh, hell yeah. He happened to be <laughs> a huge fan of my father. And um, we're friends. And so I wanted somebody else there who, you know, knew about my dad. Because when you're the director, the producer, the financier, also when I was on camera, you need someone to to watch your back. You need someone else's opinion because you can't see everything. I didn't have a big production crew. I was the giant production team of me, myself, and I. I would hire camera people as needed. Um, and I had a couple different editors. I had one who decided to quit partially on the way through because he didn't like my post supervisor. That was literally his reason for quitting. He basically said, said it was me or him, he said to me. I don't like people giving me ultimatums, mm-hmm. that's one. And two, my post team gave me all my posts deferred and to lay people who don't know what that means, that means I don't have to pay them until I sell the documentary. And then I pay them out of the proceeds. 
Mm-hmm. I have a contract to pay them for a certain amount of money. And that meant I didn't have to come up with the money up front. And if you're fronting all the costs for a documentary, and you have somebody who's giving you sixty, seventy thousand dollars worth of services and, and uh, um, post facilities for free up front, and you don't have to pay them to you sell the documentary, that's an incredible, that's not easy to negotiate with anyone. And here was my editor throwing his weight around, you know, somebody who doesn't have a name in this business, and certainly, I mean, it's not like his name was Paul Hirsch, or, mm-hmm. you know, um, or Peter, Pietro Scalia, or um, Stephen Rifkin, who edited Avatar. I mean, if, if they told me they didn't like my post-supervisor, I probably would listen. But, <laughs> you know, this guy, <laughs> who I didn't give his, his full name and credit on the documentary to him. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you noticed, but the um, name of the editor is Richard Head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, because he cost me more money in leaving, and he, he caused me problems. Yes, the uh, one you were talking about on Facebook, I, right? Yeah. Yep. I, but I overcame them. Uh, my, my animator stepped in to do some editorial work. The colorist did some editorial work. People at P3 stepped in and did some editorial work to, to make up, you know, pick up the slack at the end, you know, in the, in the post process and yeah. in the end with the archival footage to do what needed to be done. And I'm very grateful to all of them for for stepping up and standing up and, and, and believing in this project and, and also for wanting to keep the possibility for George's legacy mm-hmm. to be told, to be kept intact, keep it alive. Because without them, I wouldn't have been able to finish the project. And I absolutely am so grateful to them. And I, I can't wait to sell this thing so I can actually pay them. <laughs> I, <laughs> I feel like I really... <laughs> I, I really did my job. I can't wait till you sell it just so people can see it because I just I, I loved it so much. I mean, it was just it was it was beautiful, and that last twenty minutes just brought tears to my eyes. It really, really did. Thank you. Well, I try to weave a story, not just of my dad and the blacklist and their accomplishments and what he had done for them like to tell the story through my eyes because I really am uniquely the only person who can tell this story. And, and also because my father is my hero. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was my best friend. He was my business partner. He was my dad, but he was my hero because of what he did and the kind of person he was. And he wasn't perfect. I mean, I'm sure there are people who have stories of him that, you know, not, not being nice or... Nobody's perfect. He was Sicilian, so he had a little bit of a temper. But I think that was also, you know, indicative of the time period. People behaved differently and handled things differently in in the olden days. But he was somebody who was very forward-thinking, and he raised me to believe that I could accomplish anything I set my mind to. And he raised me to be a good human. And he raised me to be a person of my word. And I try very hard to do that. I always, I, I always say, if I can't keep my word, it's not because of me. It's because somebody else, you know, got in my way. Because I certainly get up every morning and try to be the kind of person that is my word is my bond. And mm-hmm. I know that's unique in this business. But um, I don't think we are that rare. I think, you know, corporations and lawyers have made it more difficult. They have. For sure. But um, it doesn't mean that I don't try to get up in the morning and try to be the best person I can be. And I really mean that when I say I can't wait to sell this so I can pay these people what I owe them. um, Because I am a woman of my word. They, They did me a solid. They got me to the finish line. And now... As much as, yes, of course I want to see it out there. Of course I want other people to see it. Of course it would be nice to win out accolades. All of those things are absolutely true. But the thing that occupies my mind is keeping my word. I know that sounds strange. But no. exactly what occupies my, 
my mind every day. And I think my father would have been the same way. I know he was. So I, I think you lead by example. And even as a leader, no leader is without its faults, and we, we all falter. But you lead by example. And I would like to set an example, both from my father and from me, you can be a decent human being and still be a successful person in any country. Yes. Very well said, you know? Andrea. I have, I have a couple of Christmas jokes for you before we wrap it up here. Okay. Okay, why are Christmas trees better than men? I don't know why. Even the smaller ones have satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> Very naughty. I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why did Frosty the Snowman smile? I don't know. He saw the snowblower. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my father told a lot of off-color jokes. Yeah. And my dad, because he raised me very, like, very much as an equal, you know, mm -hmm. we'd be at dinner parties, and he would make these really off-color, like, he would tell blowjob jokes. You That's know? what I do. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, but even more graphically than you did. And, and I remember somebody saying once, George, you tell those kinds of jokes in front of your daughter? And I was probably in my 30s at the time. And he said, what, she's an adult? Not like she's never heard something like this before. Yeah. I mean, to him, it just seems so normal. You know, he was, he was very aware that I was a woman, and he expected me to be a woman and, and to be a woman a you know, who was obviously, you know, not a virgin in my 30s. And I, I still appreciate that I had a dad mm -hmm. just let me be a human being and, and allow me to grow up and be an adult. And, of course, he didn't like it when, you know, he taught me how to, you know, outmaneuver someone and then I would do it to him. Yeah. You know, when we would disagree about something. And he said, you know, I taught you to do that to other people. I didn't expect you to do it to me. <laughs> <laughs> But it, secretly, he was <clears throat> proud. You know, he loved it. While he hated it, he loved it. But yeah, he, he was a really... I miss him every day. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just glad uh, we're like that, too, in my family. You know, we love off-color jokes like that. We, we tell them all the time and, and laugh at them and stuff, you know. I, I try to be a little bit more careful with my off-color jokes, you know, when I'm doing a podcast and stuff. But I've got a lot of really bad ones, a lot. <laughs> a well, lot of them. I'm going to actually recite the producer's prayer that my father had up on the wall that he, he used to thought, I think was very funny. It was a rip on the... Um, the serenity prayer for AA. Yeah. He said, um, dear God, please help me to have the courage to accept that which I cannot change. The serenity, you know, the courage to change that which I can change. The serenity to accept that which I cannot change. And the wisdom to hide all the bodies of all the people I had to kill today. And please, God, <laughs> help me to remember to be mindful of the toes I step on today because they're probably going to be connected to the ass I have to kiss tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. Love it. <laughs> and he had it up on his wall in his office, and we would just laugh, you know, because yeah. it was so very Hollywood, right? Yeah. And, but what it really was was a good reminder, you know, to, to sort of mind your P's and Q's and not to just say whatever you're about everybody and mm -hmm. in the moment, impulsive stuff your impulsive thoughts because you may have to work with that person tomorrow and, right. and also things set in anger are often fleeting feelings that go away and uh, you know things set on social media are also fleeting feelings that often go away so we all have to remember that um, to, to be mindful of our impulses even though sometimes our, our impulses can can lead us to good things. We want to try to be careful of our more destructive impulses. Say la vie, Andrea. That's I mean, I, true. I mean, I love getting notifications that you liked something dirty I posted. Always, it just it it really brings a, a thrill to me. And I'll tell you, uh -huh. I really love this documentary, and I hope it finds a home. And. 
congratulations on your engagement. I hope you two have a very happy life together and a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and be safe out there. Tommy, well, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, and I really, really appreciate, just want to say, both you and, and Python, Gilbert, yeah. when my dad died, you reached out to me to do a tribute to him, and I am so incredibly grateful that you did that, because unlike the Academy, you snubbed him, you two both realized that he had made quite a contribution to this business. And I have to applaud you for that. Oh, absolutely. We Lasky kids, we love the movies. <laughs> yeah, but still, it meant a lot to me, especially in a moment where I, I had just lost him and I was grieving him. And it meant a lot to me to know that there were other people out there who thought he had made uh, his time on this planet had had an impact. Oh. It's my pleasure, Andrea, and I'm sure Greg will hear this and he will say the exact same thing. You have yourself a happy holiday season, and once again, be safe. Thank you. You too, and, and always, always, be yourself. Be yourself. Be yourself. Be the best you can be. My dad would always say that. Take care, Tommy. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Andrea Lito, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, my God, so passionate. She loves her father so much. He was an amazing man. I wish I could have met him. Oh, my God. And I love that kudos she gave to me and Greg Gilbert. That was just so sweet and fantastic. Hey, he made good. He made great movies, you know, Over the Edge, Dressed to Kill. You know, go see them. You know, if you haven't watched those movies, go watch them. They're friggin' great. Well... Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes!